the same rules apply for this round. And I think both, um, both of the candidates were present and know the rules, the ground rules, and so I think we're ready to go. Um, our position one candidates for the 24th district are Mike Chapman, Democrat, incumbent, and Jody Wilkie, Republican. And if you want to applaud, uh, you can go ahead and get it out of your system right now. So I'm going to ask you, Jody, take it. I'll take the right. All right, Jody goes first for opening statement. Well, here we are again. <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. Uh, some of you already know me and many of you don't. Um, my political career kind of started here in Jefferson County last year, other than just some small things that I did as an activist in my home back in Camino Island. Um, but I worked on the Prop 1 uh, campaign and as the people who live here in Jefferson County know, we soundly defeated that proposal, 68.2%. Um, people voted against it because they were tired of having taxes increased without the uh, representation. It was a poorly designed bill, maybe with the good idea of helping other, others with housing, but it was not put together in a way that was beneficial. It would also cause harm to many thousands of people who couldn't afford their taxes already. And as I talked to the people of this county, they told me that the taxes were too high. They told me that they're tired of not being represented and they're tired of being ignored. Um, we had many other alternatives as far as housing is concerned and they were actually included within the bill or the proposal um, as far as a solution for the housing problem. But the fact was that the people who wrote this proposal thought the first place to go should be the pockets of the taxpayers. The people of Jefferson County pushed back against that. I happen to agree, and I think that you all were very much in the right. So with that said, um, some of you know I'm a nurse by trade. Um, it's my job to care for people. It's my job to um, analyze symptoms of a person and um, take a look at how they're responding to the care that they're being given. And I've kind of done that same thing as far as um, looking at what's going on in our district. But in addition to being a nurse, I've had other experiences. Believe it or not, I've been a construction worker and I'm a journeyman laborer. I've been a boat builder. I've worked in other industries and I've helped to start a company up from scratch. Um, I've done computer and database work, real estate, and finance work. All of these varied experiences leave me in a uniquely qualified position to be your representative because I can understand the struggles of small businesses and the struggles of individuals in this district. I know that our GDP has gone down 6%, excuse me, um, in the past eight years. I know that our unemployment is almost double the national average. I think that we can do better, and I think that we have to do better. We have to do a lot of things to improve the economics of our district. And that's why I have a passion for running for this office. And I hope that you'll consider voting for me. Thank you. Well, thank you all tonight uh, for being here again tonight, uh, taking time out of your busy schedule and coming in listening to Four people who are running for office, two of us hold the office, and so I'm your state representative. I live in Port Angeles with my wife. We have two boys in college. Previous to serving as your state rep, I was a 16-year Clallam County Commissioner, and previous to that, I had a 10-year law enforcement career where I got to be involved in some really cool cases. Uh, I have a master's degree, a bachelor's degree, and a uh, AA degree from Shoreline College, and all of that gets me is I still have to pay three bucks for a cup of coffee at Starbucks, but it is part of my story and part of my background. Uh, my first term in the legislature, I kind of hit the ground running because of my 16 years of experience in Clallam County government. Uh, first session, right out of the gate, I was able to secure $30 million plus for a brand new Elwha River Bridge, which is a huge 
uh, in public infrastructure investment in our district and moves goods and services from the southern end of our district to the northern end of our district. Uh, GA Rookie getting $30 million for a new bridge. Uh, they said it couldn't be done, and I said it has to be done. We have to rebuild that bridge. We have to keep the current bridge open, and we're doing just that. And by this time next year, we'll be starting construction. That'll be a great part of our economic growth on our, in our area. It's going to be a great job for contractors. Another, another issue that came up that I would have never dreamed I worked on, but I'm really proud of, is that I found out late in a 60-day session earlier this year that Grace Harbor was about ready to lose its last pediatrician because of the lower Medicaid reimbursement rates for pediatricians. And I said, that's unacceptable. That's my district, that's my county. And so I worked with budget leadership, put together a team of representatives, and we put together a program and a budget proviso to increase the Medicaid reimbursement rate for pediatricians uh, in rural Washington. And it was a bipartisan group. Uh, it was a good program, and I just got off the phone the other day with the clinic down in Grace Harbor. Not only is the one pediatrician gonna stay there hiring a second, and she'll be starting July 1st. So that services to low-income families will be able to, through the higher reimbursement rate. And then finally, I'm just really proud of the fact that, you know, I voted against the largest property tax increase in our state's history because I didn't think that was the right way to fund basic education. I voted for a property tax cut. And one other bill that was in the House draft budget was the rural manufacturing tax cut for rural manufacturers across Washington State. And it was in the House budget, we couldn't get it through the Senate, but that would have lowered the B&O tax rate that Boeing pays to the Boeing preferential rate just for manufacturers just in rural Washington. That alone would spur job growth, expansion of manufacturing, and would entice manufacturers in the I-5 corridor to move to rural Washington. I'm not gonna give up, I'm gonna come back with that bill, refine it, and get it passed. I'd appreciate your vote to keep working hard on your behalf. Thanks. Do we have anybody with questions? At the risk of boring all the uh, audience here, I'm going to repeat the question I said for the first two candidates. Uh, my name is Mike Cornforth. I'm a resident of Port Townsend here. Will you support legislation that requires universal background checks and bans semi-automatic weapons and high-capacity magazines? Thank you. Uh, I support uh, Initiative 1693. I co-sponsored legislation that would raise the age to 21, like you have to buy a pistol, yet can't be a buy a pistol until you're 21, would have raised the age to 21 to buy an assault weapon. I voted for the bump stock ban. I don't believe in banning assault weapons, I just, but we need to raise the age to 21. Initiative 1693 will do the work the legislature didn't. We missed some opportunities. It also includes safe storage that I worked on and co-sponsored and provides for training before people buy semi-automatic weapons. Think about that. You can walk in now and put up less of a background check, be a younger age to buy a semi-automatic weapon than you can to buy a pistol. And I just think Initiative 1693 is gonna pass. It's polling incredibly off the charts. People are tired of these mass shootings. They're tired of people being in danger and I strongly support the initiative. As far as um Universal background checks, as my uh, Jim McIntyre running also for the other seat, he stated, and this is true, that we already have in place legislature uh, for background checks. And if we will utilize the laws that are already in place, that would go a long way uh, towards satisfying maybe some of your group that, that um, proposes those types of things. Um, I also do not favor banning um, assault rifles, so-called assault rifles or semi-automatic rifles. And I'm also, surprisingly enough, I'm not for banning guns for younger persons. I, I, not to call attention to anyone, but I happen to have a roommate who's very, a young lady who's very attractive, and I know that uh, she, she can get a lot of attention that she doesn't necessarily want, and there's a lot of people out there like that. Um, I don't think that young people should be banned from self-protection if they so choose. Um, I also think that 
um, if you look at the statistics, more gun crimes are committed with handguns than with, a, with a semi-automatic guns. But yet, I don't hear anybody calling for a ban on handguns. And I think that would go over about like a lead balloon. So I think we need to take a look at the users um, rather than the, the hardware itself, because um, uh, if, uh, if the problem is uh, school shooters, the problem occurs long before they get their hands on a gun. It's a mental issue, and we need to take a look at those kinds of problems and solve those. Those are really um, heartfelt issues that we need to support families and young people and people in school so that they don't find themselves in a situation where they're so angry and so upset with life that they want to cause that kind of harm and damage to others. It's definitely a problem of thinking. Thank you. Well, at the risk of uh, the prior question, I'll, I will ask the same question again, so it's going to be a repeat. Are you in favor of the Initiative 1600, the single-payer health care? If so, how will you explain to your constitu constituents that by admission of the initiative's rider, it will be the largest tax increase in Washington state history, especially with Clallam County having an unemployment rate below the state average? Thank you. As we all know, um, the price of health care is a problem. It's a real challenge to some people. Um, even people who are on um, dealing with the uh, um, affordable health care, I hear um, their premiums are upwards of seven or eight hundred dollars a month. So um, that was touted as a solution, and it turned out not to be so. Um, there's changes that need to be made in the healthcare industry, and many of them are not being addressed. Uh, tort reform, insurance reform, pharmaceuticals, uh, regulatory reform. I recently worked for a healthcare facility that closed, and um, much of the problem had to do with the fact that the elderly board of directors were so dissatisfied and frustrated with the ideas of the problems that they had dealing with the regulatory burdens that they just simply got tired of dealing with it. So um, regardless of how we handle this, I don't support a universal health care bill. Um, I think we need to address these other problems first before we make whole scale changes to our health care system. I also want to point out that that particular bill includes in it a, um, a um, income tax. I don't know if you all knew that, a 1% income tax. Now, income tax is not a great way to base our health care because it's volatile by nature. When the economy is up, tax in, uh, revenue is up, and when the economy is down, our tax revenue goes down. I don't really think that's a great way to fund health care because it just is too volatile. Do you really want to put uh, your family and your kids in that kind of a situation where their health care uh, is available only when the economy is good. I don't think that's a great way to fund health care. So um, I guess my time is up. Thank you. It uh, doesn't look like that initiative is going to be on the ballot. So it's kind of a red herring argument about an initiative that's not going to qualify. Look, I support single payer. Uh, we're seeing an outright assault, an outright assault on health care rights in America from Washington, D.C. in the courts. There are people who want to take away health care from working class people all across our America. And I'm going to fight as hard as I can because you all provide my health care. Whoever wins this seat, we're going to have health care. We're not going to have to worry about it. But we're going to be representing 175,000 people. And the vast majority of them who are working class are seeing their rights to access affordable health care being taken away. And if Washington State is gonna have a great opportunity to stand up strong and say, we're gonna be a single payer state. We're gonna provide health care for the working men and women of this state. We are gonna fight back on the Trump administration and the Republican Congress who wants to take away, think about it, they wanna take away health care for families, for moms, for dads, for families, for kids. 
everything they believe is that you all should just figure out a way to pay for health care, and oh, by the way, just buy it from the insurance companies while they rack up corporate profits beyond belief. And I'm going to fight against that every day that I'm in the legislature. I believe in a single-payer system. I'm going to work toward a single-payer system. And we can do this as Washington citizens. We can push back on this assault against health care rights here in Washington, blue Washington, the last bastion of blue America. We're seeing a red tide sweep across America. We can push back on this assault on workers and families who are provide, wanting to, they want to be able to take their kids to the doctor. They want to make sure they're healthy. We're going to push back, and I believe in a single payer system at the state level. has a, an idea how to solve the problem and hopefully one will be found. So next question. Actually my question, um, I'm Linda Martin and I'm with uh, PT Indivisible uh, and their healthcare group and I actually um, circulated that petition and was kind of amazed at some of the response I got from people when they found out that the funding plan did include, in fact, a 1% income tax, uh, but that there would be no cost at all to people who made only 4%, four times the poverty level. So I have to say that I really, I really like the way you're going with this. I know that you uh, did fund a feasibility study for that, and um, whole Washington, paid uh, an Amherst professor uh, a lot of money to come up with the plan that would have funded uh, I-1600. And I'm sure that they would be happy to share that with the legislature uh, and I'm and sorry, I'm you. sorry to interrupt you, but is there a question? Yes, would you, would you be willing to um, work with a whole Washington and their funding plan? Yeah, they've, they've already started to contact legislators. We took some steps last session to begin to put this in place where we could look at it. Obviously, funding it with an income tax is, an, is, is a non-starter because, you know what, and I get blamed all the time, like, you're, you're going to put in an income tax. I can't. The legislature can't put in an income tax. Only you, the voters, can. So until you rise up and start an initiative for an income tax, it's, it's one of those things in politics where it's, you know, we're going to demonize the other side because they're going to put in an income tax when we don't have the authority to do that in our Constitution. But we can look at, think about this, for how many of us have paid into Medicare? And then when we retire, we have access to Medicare services. And it was a very small amount that we paid in our whole working lives. Apple Care is a very affordable system that families in this state should be able to buy in to Apple Care. Why are we putting artificially low limits on Apple Care? There are a number of ways that we can fund this. And for those, I think they debated it earlier, that just dismissed it. Well, Vermont looked at it. Well, we're not Vermont. We're Washington. And we can partner with Oregon and California and come up with a, probably a system that would work for the three left coast states that are, again, left against this. I'm pretty frustrated with the assault on, on, on health care. Of all the things, of all the things coming out of Washington, D.C., and my God, is there not enough coming out on an everyday basis, they're trying to take away women's rights to choose. They're trying to take away women's access to health care. They're trying to take families the ability for families to go to doctors and have it affordable. If there's not one thing that we as Americans should stand up for is the right to see a doctor and not have to worry about whether we can pay for that or not. That is something that this state can do and we can offer it. And gee, just think about it. Think of the economic growth and opportunity. If we had a simple single payer system, businesses would say, you know what, I think I'll leave. Idaho and Montana and the Midwest and come into Washington State. This is a place I want to do business. You're talking about economic growth, provide services that people actually want. Okay. Well, I'm not sure what the actual question was other than if as a legislator I'm willing to work with your group as far as finding out funding figuring out funding for universal health care or health care 
No, I, the, the group that put together um, the initiative 1600 hired uh, an economist from Amherst mm. who had also done the health uh, program for Massachusetts okay. and found that there were going to be savings for the state with a single payer. Oh, I so see. I, my question was, would the legislature be willing to work with, with uh, Dr. Friedman and uh, in putting the funding plan together? I see. Okay. Um, as far as, uh, well, of course my preference is not for a single payer health care system. So um, that question of funding a single payer health care system, I hope is one that we can avoid. I think that the people in the taxpayer have indicated pretty clearly that they're not in favor of that type of a health care system. Overall, there are groups of people like many of you here who are for that. I agree and I understand that. But I do think one thing we can all agree on is the fact that we need to do something a little different. I named four different areas that we can at least look at as far as reforms. And I think we have to, um, I don't know, we don't have to agree, but I would like to suggest that trying to fix things that we know are broken is a better way of going about it on an incremental basis as far as making changes to health care rather than just taking the whole thing and throwing it out and starting over with universal. So there has been examples, not only in our country, but in other countries as well, I mean, in um, other states and other countries as well where they've tried universal health care. And it has its bumps in the road. So I think that there's some things that we can avoid simply by utilizing a feedback loop where we take an issue that uh, we want to try to fix and make an attempt to fix it and see what the result is, see how that works out. Um, I think that we can make some improvements to health care without upending um, the whole baby and buggy, so to speak. Um, I know that there's a lot of people in this room that don't agree with that, but that's the way that I feel, and I think it would be better for individuals and for businesses. All right, next question. Yes, it's another question about housing. Um, the last time I saw you here, Jody, yeah. you were leading a demonstration through the door and disrupting our meeting, and I called the police. All right, that's um, not a question. No. You, now that you are... It's not a true fact, either. <laughs> now that you are uh, not campaigning against a specific measure, what solutions do you have? I have heard solutions of the private market. The private market always works. It's constantly working. I've heard the suggestion that uh, land use will make housing cheap enough for uh, low-income families. Uh, charities are working their tails off, Oli Cap, Peninsula Housing Authority. The Housing Trust Fund has been there available all along. Um, the, the soaring cost of land, this was, a, this was a good, when I came here, this was a reasonable place to live for p folks who didn't have very much money. It is not now. I'm what sorry. can we do about I'm, that? Okay, what, what, to, all right, did you understand that? Ms. Wilkie. I think it's the same question that we've been right, trying good. to answer for some time now, actually. I'm okay with that. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, again, I think that looking to take money out of the pockets of taxpayers as your first option is not the best way of going about solving a problem as far as public policy. I think the people of Jefferson County spoke up pretty loudly that they agree on that fact. Maybe not the majority of the people who come in this room, but when I go out there into the county and I talk to people, that's what they told me, and that's the way they voted too, hands down. So there are a lot of things, and many of those things were actually included in the prop proposition. And they're still continuing to be discussed as the commissioner race heats up in this area. So some of those things include relaxing the Growth Management Act um, to make carve-outs for rural areas so that we can accommodate not only housing districts and higher density housing, but um, urban growth areas and um, infrastructure, encourage improvements to the permitting process, environmental impact statement requirements can be loosened, analyses to find ways to improve infrastructure and rural growth zones, improve um, 
access to people for water and sewer rights on lands, um, I mean septic system um, permitting processes. A lot of, I've talked to a lot of developers and they basically say Jefferson County is one of the worst places to come to build. Um, many of the people that were my opponents in Prop 1, um, they said, well, those, um, those developers want to build $500,000 homes. That is not the case. There, uh, there are several of them that I spoke to that want to build um, low-cost family homes. And I don't think that we need to have affordable housing where the government is regulating each aspect of how the housing and the rental is managed. This is an issue that I know something about as a former county commissioner, and it's probably the reason why I've been endorsed by the Building Industry Association of Washington. The local home builders uh, have endorsed me, the local realtors, Port Angeles and Squim Association of Realtors. And I say that realizing, realizing there are members of my party that are probably not thrilled that I've been endorsed by the home builders and the realtors. But I think they understand that I know the issue, and I'm working with them on the issue. I actually, in my first two years, co-sponsored or sponsored six different pieces of legislation, two of which passed four which didn't. One which didn't would have returned some of the state sales tax back to cities to be used for affordable housing in those cities. Pretty good plan, couldn't get it through the Republican Senate. Another bill that I co-sponsored would have been a property tax exemption to encourage affordable housing in local communities. Again, couldn't get any support from some of my Republican counterparts. Uh, one bill that did pass will, allow, will now allow cities and counties to reduce the square footage. There was actually a, a, a size of home that you had to build, and so we're going to let local governments determine if they can go to the tiny house movement. Another bill that passed would just increase state resources to local communities. This bill, we had no Republican co-sponsors. And this, is, this has driven me nuts from my first session. This bill would have allowed churches to bypass the Growth Management Act and provide affordable housing on their church land. This was a Democrat bill. I walked across the aisle. I said, you're the party of faith, apparently. You're the party that is supported by churches. You're the party that believes in, you know, that, that bring religion into the public square. Co-sponsor this piece of legislation with me. Let's give local churches the ability to bypass Bag, big bad government, bypass growth management, and put affordable housing, because many churches nowadays own large tracts of land. And there was a church in Hoquiam that was trying to provide affordable homeless ha housing and, 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 and working with the pastor. Not one Republican in the legislature would co-sponsor that legislation, and we couldn't move it through. Are you kidding me? The party of faith? The party that says that they have a... We're out of time. Are we out of questions? No? All right. Um, <clears throat> I know, from John Cook, um, I know for a fact our commissioners have talked to you about the Growth Management Act and how it's hurting rural Washington counties. Um, what have you done to help the counties with that? What have you actually done to help that? And for Jody, what will you do to help that? Not only working with your commissioners, but the realtors who get endorsed me, the home builders, it's an important issue. We've got to give local tools to local government. We've got to help just like this. This, this bill on a lot, and I'm sorry I offended you, but why would not Republicans work with me? I'm just asking. It, the, rea the reality is it was I couldn't get a Republican co-sponsor. And in Olympia, most legislation like this needs some bipartisanship. You've got it. We don't pass a lot of partisan issues. Quite frankly, most of the legislation that passes is bipartisan. And this would have been one of the one of the marks that we could have used to say we're going to reduce the regulations of growth management for churches. It would have been a pilot project. It would have showed that you could reduce some of the re restrictions for affordable housing on faith-based pieces of property, which then could have expanded to other nonprofits. That was the idea. That's why you start with the faith-based fo folks. You start with churches who want to help. They want to help. So what did I do? I worked and worked and worked. I'm going to bring that bill back. And this time, I am for sure going to find a Republican co-sponsor. And we're going to move that piece of legislation forward because it's a good idea. It's exactly what you want, the church working to help 
those who need affordable housing, the church working to help those, feed those. That's the mission of the church. And can government help? Certainly. And let's be a partner in that. Well, I don't know for sure, but I just have a gut feeling that if the uh, Republican caucus was not supportive of that, there, there might have been a little bit more to it than just trying to get churches to help um, allow what you call affordable housing on church property. I guess my question would also be, why limit it just to the churches? Aren't there people out there who own property that could be used for uh, low-cost family housing? I don't think that we should be picking winners and losers in that or in any other business-related bills. Um, I think that we should make some carve-outs and give more local control to the use of the land that people have and allow them to uh, do more, uh, more building for people that uh, have needs for low-cost family homes. Um, I think that we can do uh, give incentives for builders, uh, things like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, things like um, partner with infrastructure or um, street building or um, the lights or um, the power access, things like that, that can be um, shared costs and not necessarily just b borne by the developers. Um, I think that's just a place to start. And uh, we should be more creative in taking a look at the land and the way that we use it. I think that there's a lot more that can be done um, as far as relaxing the urban growth areas. Uh, we don't necessarily need a full complement of police, fire, um, you know, uh, PUD, and all of these services for some of these small areas. Maybe they can piggyback off of some of the next door bigger cities um, and that will allow to have um, more uh, services available, which would allow, I don't know, you look like you don't know what I'm saying. So uh, the urban growth areas have requirements in them that I guess my time is up. Look it up or ask me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk about it. Any more questions? Hi, my name is Ruth Gordon. I'm a Port Townsend resident and voter. I'm also an elected official. Um, my experience is that when I ran for office, I ran for a partisan office and I was supported by a party. But as soon as I was elected and sworn in, I represent and work for everyone. So I'd like you to address your thoughts on um, what I consider, maybe you do too, but a hyper-partisan atmosphere in the legislature that makes it very difficult for um, our legislators to work for us in our district when they have to hew to the directions of the caucus. So would you please talk about partisanship in the legislature, please? Sure. I, I got to say I love that question. That's a great question. As a conservative woman and as a voter, um, I appeal to other voters and, and women uh, to place, and, and men too, to place policies ahead of parties. In doing so, I think we can make improvements not only to our government, but to our society and our communities. And um, we can isolate these policies and these issues from the hateful rhetoric. We have um, a lot of hateful rhetoric going on in the mass media, in social media, demonstrations. Um, I just think that we need to focus in our hearts on what we know is important for the county that we live in, for our families. Um, we all have a vision of kindness that we want to um, perpetrate in our, in our communities and in our families. And we want to be able to reach a loving hand out to people who are in need. If we can rise above this hateful party divisions and focus on issues, doing unbiased research on our own, too, um, as in, informed voters, we can support um, resolutions in our government and work together better if we're focused on the issues rather than this kind of hair on fire effect that we seem to have in our community today, in our, in our world and in our country. Um, I try to study issues and disassemble them into bite-sized pieces 
analyze them, get counsel wherever needed. And uh, much like I did in my profession as a nurse, um, I think this approach will set an example to other people in the legislature, my cohorts, and um, help us all to find common ground. Um, I think as, um, as a legislator, we need to remember that it's the people that we serve, not the government, and surely not the media, and definitely not ourselves. Uh, every piece of legislation that I prime sponsored, except one, had a Republican co-sponsor. Every piece of le legislation that I sponsored that passed was passed with a bipartisan vote. Talked a little bit on Sunday about my community college bill and how it will allow it to public-private partnership. That bill passed 98 to nothing off the House floor and 47 to 1 with only a downtown Seattle senator voting no. I was a rookie. It had bipartisan support with another rookie from Eastern Washington, Representative Steele, and 98 to nothing to provide community college job force training, a partnership between the government and private businesses. The businesses don't have to participate. It's completely voluntary. 98 to nothing off the House floor, 47 to one off the Senate, it was signed by the governor. It's a great piece of legislation aimed at rural Washington to provide the job skills that we need, 98 to nothing. Not one Republican voted no. It's that good of a, it's a good bipartisan legislation. Every bill I prime sponsored, except one, had a Republican co-sponsor, and every bill that passed that I prime sponsored was a bipartisan bill. I said I was endorsed by the builders and the realtors. I've also been endorsed by the Washington Environmental Council and the Sierra Club. So if you're hyper-partisan, you can't work across different lines, you don't get those endorsements. And I've had those endorsements every time I've run for office. There was a bill that was before us that the environmental community and the home building community was at odds at, along with the timber community. And I said, you guys go work it out, bring a compromise back, and then we'll move it through committee. You let them work together, they'll find the solution. People wanna work together in Olympia. Most of what we do is widely bipartisan, widely. The headlines are driven by the partisan votes. I've been told that we've run out of time except for our closing arguments. And uh, Mr. Chapman will be the first to close. Don't want let, to let Steve know that I said this, but I agreed with what Jim said earlier in his closing comments. Local government's a great experience to take to the legislature, local government experience. It's interesting that Jim has a couple of terms in local government, Steve three terms, myself four terms as a county commissioner. That experience is what you take to Olympia, the ability to work across party lines. My frustration on the earlier bill was that Republicans should have co-sponsored that bill. And I'll, I've talked to a few, and they know they missed an opportunity. They're hearing from people in their communities. There's an issue across our state, and churches want to help. And I think I'll get there with Republicans to, to provide. That's, that was my point. It was frustrating. But it's the ability to work across the aisle, build relationships, and work hard. I've been accused in this campaign of being a non-existent representative. Look at my Facebook page for the last two years. My personal one. 35,000 miles plus. I'm on my second car, and I haven't completed my second year. 35,000 miles plus since this time last year. I'm not a disappearing representative. I was at the Boys and Girls Club today in Squim, handing out lunches. Then I moved to Cary Blake Park and talked to kids over there as we handed out more lunches. I'm available, 360-477. 1131 is my personal cell phone number that I pay for. If you need something, give me a call or shoot me a text. I was recently speaking to a group of middle schoolers. I've had a lot of texts from middle schoolers since I gave out my <laughs> phone number. That was not probably my wisest moment. But I'm available, I'm accessible, I have bipartisan support across the aisle. I have a lot of support. It's actually humbling how much support. And yeah, I get a little passionate. 
to fight for the people that I am representing. And I'm positive. I'm optimistic about our future, even in the face of what I see at the federal level of kind of this weirdness that's going on. Washington can be a beacon of progressive, good policy, but also moderate policy. Tax cuts for businesses. I sponsored two bills to cut the B&O tax. I voted against a property tax increase. Bucked my party to do that. One of only a handful of Democrats that voted against the property tax increase. I voted for a property tax cut and sponsored a number of bills. I'm not a big spender, big tax Democrat. You won't find me yet with a record of voting for a tax increase. I'd love your vote, I'd love to keep working for you. I think I'd like to have a third car by this time next year. Well, I have no doubt that um, Mike's heart is in the right place and that he's probably put a lot of miles on his cars. But from what I'm discovering in my travels, which have been significant since I took on this role as a candidate, um, there is a lot of hardship going on and there are a lot of people who do not believe they're being heard. Um, one example, which is kind of difficult to bring up at this point, but just Monday night, Mike said he believes that the difficulties that we were talking about were a myth, that we're doing just fine, that there's not this hardship that people are claiming to have. And yet the numbers belie that fact. The unemployment figures are close to twice the national average. And as Jim McIntyre was saying, our gross Domestic product has gone down 6% over the past eight years. That's a problem, okay? Uh, there's a lot of other issues that need to be dealt with. Um, out of 1,254 votes, I understand only five of them were against the party line. That seems to me that we have a, um, an issue of sort of going along to get along, um, and that's kind of sad. We have completely different needs in rural Washington than we have um, over on the I-5 corridor. And yet it seems that there is no such thing as a rural-urban divide. That's too bad because I really honestly think that there are a lot of different needs that we have here in rural Washington that are completely different from what we have in Seattle. And if you want to have our beautiful area look like Seattle, then keep doing the same thing. That's all I have to say. I was over there for my, for my uh, class reunion, and I can't believe all the tent cities. It's shocking. So I was also down in uh, Grays Harbor, and they're starting up there. The tent cities are there. And there was suggestions in the Proposition 1 uh, that we should relax the rules on tent cities here. Uh, they used other fancy words to try to um, hide that fact. We need economic development. And um, you know, Mike claims that we made a property tax reduction, but in order to accomplish that, they had to raid the rainy day fund. I don't know how you can explain that. I really don't. Um, we need to care for our students. And yet Mike voted against funding resource officers in the schools. I don't even understand that for a former police officer. Um, we really need to have robust protection for our kids in the schools, and we need to take a look at all sorts of protection for our kids in the schools, including hardening the security. And my time is up. Thank you very much. I hope you'll vote for me. All right. Uh, applause for both candidates this time. And I'd like to thank the candidates and all of you for caring about our community and coming tonight to participate. Good night.